going to start uh, with just an example of an alternative, which somehow relates to some of the things that, uh, that uh, Ulrich mentioned, uh, an alternative to the support vector machine problem, which is that of novelty detection, um, and how we can kind of formalize novelty detection in a similar way uh, to that we did with um, support vector machines. In other words, taking some sort of theoretical bound uh, on the performance that we're interested in and translating that through an optimization problem into an algorithm. And then I'm going to uh, talk about, again, something that Ulrich has touched on and perhaps in you know, more advanced uh, applications than I'm going to consider, but I wanted to make the connection to Bayesian machine learning and particularly Gaussian processes because there's a very tight connection um, between kernel methods and uh, Gaussian processes, which I think is very illustrative. And uh, in many cases, people have tended to treat these as completely separate uh, domains and you know, potentially even some opposition between the two. Uh, which I think is, is, is completely wrong. We should be seeing, you know, different angles can show different perspectives on, uh, diff on the same technique, actually. Um, and I think enhance our understanding of what's going on. And I, I, I always come back to the points of theory uh, is really to try to get our intuition uh, aligned with some of the fundamental things that are driving machine learning performance in order to get a better understanding of how to adapt and apply those methods in practical applications. So I'll dive into the Bayesian machine learning uh, and talk about how that can, uh, let's say, give us insights into what choices of kernels are actually doing in terms of defining prior functions uh, over the uh, priors over the function class. Uh, and then finally, I'll turn a very brief uh, look at applications of these ideas in reinforcement learning, um, just to bring out the point that these core kind of models that we've been looking at are often ingredients in more advanced systems that can then be used to drive, uh, you know, AI applications that uh, are able to have uh, useful, uh, useful interactions with the real world. Okay, so um, that's my overview. So the SVM ex uh, extension to novelty detection, and then I say, uh, this is just repeating what I just said. So here's the novelty detection. So the idea of uh, novelty detection is we'd like to, we only have positive examples. So this was an, you know, an, in the movie case, this was something that we typically would have only We'd only know about what people watched. We wouldn't know about what they didn't watch or didn't like. And so how can we try to uh, think of modeling that kind of system and the performance of that system that we'd like to uh, uh, analyze? So the, um, the way in which this can be done is to, again, use Radamacher complexity and try to, in this case, in a kernel-defined feature space, create a sphere that contains the data, the smallest possible sphere that we can uh, generate to contain the data in this high dimensional. And then we can actually apply Radamacher complexity to bound the probability that a new test point from the same distribution, remember now the distribution is the distribution of the positive examples. These are the examples that we uh, actually had rated or you know, that the person had, sorry, viewed uh, we're talking about the implicit feedback, so we don't have negative feedback, we just have the things that they viewed, so things they presumably liked. And what we would like to uh, bound is the probability that something that this system identifies is actually uh, not uh, a positive. So the system is trying to kind of isolate what it is uh, that the user likes and uh, try to shrink the if you like, the sphere of that estimation as far as possible while guaranteeing that they still are likely to capture the, um, with high probability, the things they capture are positive. 
Um, so there's a tension between creating a tight bound and defining a small sphere. And the idea is that the bound is ensuring we're guaranteeing that probability while shrinking the sphere as far as we possibly can. And this is the, uh, the function that sort of measures our performance. It's sort of zero if we're inside the sphere. So here, the center of the sphere is, is uh, defined by this vector C in the feature space. Um, so the uh, data point now, X, is mapped into the feature space, if you remember, with the, with the uh, feature mapping phi. And this measures the distance of the, uh, the, the point from the center of the sphere. And we're going to say that it has, it, it's good, it's, it's in the distribution, if, uh, so not considered uh, an error, if you like, if it's less than some radius. And then there's this sort of ramp up function that is going to ramp up between that radius and the radius plus gamma, or radius squared plus gamma, and then it's going to be uh, an outlier. So G is saying, is the function an inlier, or something that is part of a distribution, or is it an outlier? And what we're saying is the probability of something generated according to the same distribution that generated the positive data being regarded as an outlier is less than or equal to this uh, expression, which again has the empirical error here and the Rademacher complexity bound uh, plus this, if you remember, this was the uh, term that ensured we were taking into account the very small probability that we were misled by the training set. Okay, so that uh, is the, um, the bound and the uh, function that we would like to uh, optimize. And now we just translate that bound into a set of criteria. This is the empirical error as measured with this uh, slack variables again, which measure the degree to which we are outside of the sphere. Um, and then we minimize the radius plus this sum of the slack variables and uh, with a trade-off parameter C uh, subject to, this, to the appropriate constraints, namely that the point is within uh, a distance R squared plus psi I, or the distance squared from the center of the sphere is uh, less than or equal to R squared plus psi I. And of course, we're minimizing over the choice of the center the radius and the slack variables. And the slack variables have to be greater than or equal to zero. So again, it's looking similar, but, but different, of course, to a support vector machine. Uh, but you can uh, crank the same handle. It's a convex optimization. And we can do our trans, uh, Lagrange multiplier tricks to include these, take the derivatives with respect to the primal variables, uh, use those equations, setting those equal to zero, those derivatives, we uh, get expressions for the primal variables in terms of the dual variables, substitute back into the Lagrangian, here's the Lagrangian, with the uh, Lagrange multipliers alpha i for each of those constraints, the beta i for the psi i, we take the derivatives with respect to the primal variables, set them equal to zero, and use those equations to substitute back into this expression to remove the, um, the primal variables. And uh, we end up with this expression here, which is the thing, the objective of the new uh, optimization. And uh, here it is. This is the thing that we are uh, attempting to minimize, subject to the constraints that have also come out of those derivatives, setting it those derivatives equal to 0, that the sum of the alpha i is equal to 1, and 0 less than or equal to alpha i less than or equal to c. And uh, the actual function we're using to make a decision as to whether something is an outlier is given by this expression, where D is, again, uh, obtained from the solutions of the dual optimization. So again, we've translated into something that we can optimize uh, only in terms of these dual variables, these alphas. And we never have to work explicitly in the feature space, so we're making this sphere in the feature space with never actually computing the, uh, in that space. So space could be very high dimensional, even infinite dimensional, and yet we're able to compute the sphere and find these, uh, these solutions. Um, there is an alternative way of doing this that uh, I'm not going to delve into, but you can 
which was, I think, also very related to what Ulrich was talking about in terms of uh, where I, here I'm sort of thinking of the negative as just the origin, but you can put a kind of background distribution or a sort of measure on your space and generate negative data from that distribution and then treat it as a two-class problem in which the sort of background distribution is generating the negative data and the other data is your positive data. And again, you can then treat this as a normal support vector machine. But the bound that you need to use is again this one class bound in terms of the data that's generated according to the positive distribution. So that, that's just a, perhaps a, another way of moving into a slightly more practical version of this, uh, of this algorithm. So the reason uh, that here's an example of what it might look like in uh, this is the sort of shrink wrapped. Uh, this is a sphere in the feature space, but in the input space, of course, it becomes a region. And indeed, because these uh, uh, some of the alpha i's are equal to zero, if we choose a kernel that is actually a uh, let's say a Gaussian distribution, then we actually get a distribution in the input. Um, uh, which can be useful, perhaps, or intuitively pleasing. Uh, but anyway, this is the kind of thing that we get in, in the input space. So my reason for giving you that was just to show, you know, this is how this kind of approach can be used flexibly for different tasks and different optimizations um, and uh, deliver, you know, solutions that have uh, performance guarantees in this uh, situation. Okay, so the main topic I wanted, as I say, to mention was this connection to Bayesian machine learning. So just to start with, the Bayesian analysis of learning actually moves away from this IID assumption on the generation of the data. And it uh, introduces uh, a different source of randomness. Uh, and there are two, basically, distributions that are considered. There's a prior distribution over the possible choice of hypotheses. So you have your function class and you imagine that there's some predefined likelihood you would see of the different functions. Uh, how you choose that we'll leave open for the moment. And then there's a, a, a likelihood model or additive noise model for the inaccuracy in the measurement of the outputs. Um, so the randomness in the generation of the examples is ignored. So we don't take into account some distribution generating the inputs, but simply the generation or a distribution over the hypotheses plus the uh, likelihood model of the actual observation given a function. Um, so let's just firstly consider these uh, two sources of randomness in a little bit more detail. Um, so if we think about the additive noise model, what this is saying is that given a function f and an input x, however they're given to us, there is a probability distribution over the uh, actual output that we would observe. And this is, depending on the type of problem we're considering, for example, if it's classification, this might just be a probability of mislabeling. So there will be a correct, you know, f of x will be equal to either, you know, positive or negative. And then the actual label you observe will be equal to f of x with a certain probability, but could be flipped with a certain probability. So you're given the wrong label with a certain probability. Um, in regression, then typically there will be a distribution, an expectation over the y, a distribution over the y values that you might uh, see. And the expectation of that distribution would in fact be f of x. So it's sort of centered on the correct value, but there's going to be some uh, distribution around that value that you would observe. And the most popular, obviously, uh, choice would be to use a, a Gaussian noise model. So the uh, actual observation is just a Gaussian distribution of uh, centered on f of x, with a mean of the distribution of f of x, and with a variance, let's say, sigma squared. Um, so this would now be in your training set. You're not actually going to be imagining you're seeing the correct value, um, but you're actually seeing some 
perturbed value of the actual uh, correct output. And that, you know, is interpretable in terms of maybe there's some measurement noise or some randomness in the system that's causing that value to be uh, slightly inaccurate. Uh, and in the case of classification, it could be that, you know, you've used Mechanical Turk or some classifier or somebody who's been actually looking at those um, images of, say, cells and they got tired towards the end of the day or they weren't quite clear and they made an inaccurate, uh, incorrect labeling of that particular uh, image. Okay, so the prior distribution is a distribution or density over the class of functions and this should be given before seeing the data. Um, and for a finite or countably infinite class, this would just be a discrete distribution, a weight on each of the functions. Um, but for uncountable infinite classes, uncountably infinite classes, the most popular prior is actually a Gaussian, um, but with a distribution, with a dimension for each possible input <laughs> corresponding output. Okay, so it implies a distribution over functions but where each of the individual inputs, there's a kind of Gaussian distribution uh, of the output value uh, of the function at that point. Um, and uh, obviously there's going to be correlations because points that are close together should have similar output values. Um, and this kind of infinite dimensional Gaussian distribution is known as a Gaussian process. Uh, so strictly speaking, the Gaussian process is defined as uh, by saying that the marginal distribution on any finite set of inputs must be multivariate Gaussian. So you're essentially restricting thinking of this distribution over all inputs, but at any moment that you're interested in working with it, you take a finite sample and then there is a Gaussian distribution on, of the outputs uh, for that finite sample. And the Properties that are assumed, typically we take the mean to be zero, so the expected value over the probability distribution over functions of f of x for any x, which is just this integral uh, weighted, you know, uh, according to this distribution, is going to be zero. So the prior expectation of any function uh, output on a particular input is going to be zero. But the most important part is this covariance function. And this is the expected correlation or sort of covariance between two, uh, the outputs for two inputs. So you have input X, input Z, and you're gonna look at the covariance between those two outputs as you uh, average over all of the functions in the function class according to this prior distribution. Uh, so it's the expected value over the distribution of f of x times f of z for any pair of inputs. So this is the covariance function or uh, matrix if you have a finite set. And uh, this is given as the definition of the Gaussian process. So now if we take any particular finite set of training examples, x1 up to xn, then the distribution of the corresponding output values will be distributed according to a multi-dimensional Gaussian with mean zero and covariance matrix, the uh, matrix made up of the uh, entries ij is c of xi xj, so this covariance function. So that is the distribution we would observe of those values defined by that prior distribution. So effectively, the prior distribution is defined in this case by that covariance function. Um, and it's a simple observation that that must be a positive semi-definite function just by plugging this in and using the definition of C of X, Y, this expectation here, um, we can actually verify that for any vector U, this turns out to be the expectation of the sum of ui f of xi squared and therefore is greater than or equal to zero. So this uh, c satisfies that property that if you remember we used to, uh, showed uh, had to be um, 
had to be held by a kernel function. In other words, for any finite set of uh, examples, the matrix you form by taking the inner products or the kernel evaluations of each pair and putting them into a matrix, that matrix is, has non-negative eigenvalues, positive semi-definite. Um, so this covariance function has that same property. So a point in the general Gaussian distribution corresponding to an assignment of outputs for every input. So in that sense, the Gaussian distribution defines a function. Um, we're thinking of actually working with that function only on a finite set of inputs, but it actually defines a distribution over functions. Um, so the question, can we find an explicit representation for those functions? So remember, we haven't actually created a function class. We've just created a covariance matrix so far. We've just talked about the effect of this distribution on the, di the, the distribution of outputs. So we don't actually have a function class as yet. Um, so can we actually create an explicit representation for those functions? And uh, recall the trick we did with the kernel. We had this way, given a kernel that had that property of positive semi-definiteness and was symmetric, and of course this function will also be symmetric, um, we were able to construct uh, a feature space um, for which the, um, the projection into that feature space uh, created the uh, inner product that was given by that kernel function. Um, so something similar we can do here. We can say, well, okay, CXZ is a positive semi-definite function, so we can actually create a feature space, um, F, and a mapping phi such that the C of X, Z, this covariance function, is the inner product of phi of X uh, and phi of Z in that feature space. So we're gonna pull the same trick. And now, if we define our function class as the linear functions in that feature space, with the prior now defined as just a white noise Gaussian, in other words, with Z, Gaussian, the weight vector is a Gaussian centered on the origin with a symmetrical identity uh, covariance matrix, so completely you know, uh, uniform in its, in its uh, weight distribution. That function class, we can show, actually has uh, the covariance matrix that we require. So the, if we look at the Covariance now are using the, this distribution defined by this weight vector distribution here, this uh, Gaussian distribution uh, on this class here, and just plug through the, um, the evaluation so we can write f of x is just phi of x prime times w and fz is w prime times phi z. This phi of x prime can be taken out because it's just a linear factor, phi of z can be taken out. So now we just have the integral of w, w prime uh, through this uh, distribution, and that's just the covariance function of that, which is the identity, and we end up with phi of x prime phi of z, which is indeed the covariance function. So we've actually got from the definition of our Gaussian process to a representation of it, which is analogous to the representation that we had in the um, definition of the feature space of a kernel uh, function. Uh, so hence the covariance function effectively defines the prior distribution through defining an appropriate feature space. So when we're thinking of defining that prior function, we're actually defining a feature space. And I think it's that dual way of thinking about the kernel. In a sense, it's defining a feature space for us, but it's also defining a prior. It's also telling us how likely uh, the functions that we will be uh, prioritizing in our kernel algorithms, because typically what the kernel algorithm does is it, it regularizes according to the norm squared of the weight vector, and that is actually measuring the probability in the Bayesian prior, the Gaussian process prior, of that function. So it's saying choose more likely functions in that Bayesian uh, Gaussian process prior uh, in, 
in uh, contrast to less likely ones that, that do a good job. Okay, so with a prior and an additive noise model defined, we can now uh, describe what is meant by Bayesian inference. So typically, uh, this is again, has been mentioned already by Ulrich. Um, to some extent, he was talking about situations where you can't, and what I'm gonna talk about is the conjugate prior case where the noise model and the uh, uh, prior distribution are conjugate and so that we'll be able to do exact inference. Um, but I'll mention, you know, you need to move to approximate Bayesian inference, which was the topic that he was also uh, uh, introducing in, in his talk with the, um, the KL divergence uh, between this uh, uh, posterior, approximate posterior distribution defined by Q in his case. But in, in this case, we have, this is Bayes' rule. We're, we're just trying to uh, invert the probabilities uh, to get a posterior distribution, which is the probability now where we factored in the likelihood of a function. So we have a prior probability of the function, but then we can up or downgrade that probability based on how well that function does on the training data. So if that function is good on the training data, we, we're gonna give it more weight, and if it's not so good, we're gonna downweight that function. And we do that through Bayes' rule, uh, so we get then a posterior distribution, which is proportional to this prior to <laughs> the likelihood of observing the outputs given the inputs and that function, um, where this is, of course, calculated using the appropriate noise model. So, uh, if we have a finite or countably infinite function class, we can calculate the probabilities individually, but in the Gaussian process case, uh, particularly uh, we will, if we're using a Gaussian noise model, then the likelihood uh, is the product of these Gaussian probabilities of the individual outputs matching the output of the particular function. And uh, because we can move the product through the exponential to create a sum, we end up with this expression. And then if we take the Gaussian process prior, um, which we just described can be expressed in terms of this uh, Gaussian distribution uh, in the weight space, we end up with this as our posterior distribution or proportional to this. Um, and uh, suddenly this starts to look somewhat familiar. Um, and if we're wanting to optimize in terms of choosing the most likely function in the posterior distribution, then we just choose to uh, maximize that probability which corresponds to minimizing this expression. Um, and this actually turns out to be exactly the same as the optimization we had for ridge regression at the very beginning. Uh, except that now the regularization parameter is sigma squared rather than lambda. Um, so this is very nice because again, it says actually when we're doing that ridge regression, what we're choosing is the most likely function in this Gaussian process, factoring in the likelihood as measured by a Gaussian noise model. Um, and uh, if we obviously can then solve that to actually get the MAP, so-called MAP, maximum a posteriori probability solution, uh, which is exactly the same as the solution of uh, the ridge regression optimization that I started with uh, yesterday. Um, however, Bayesian inference has a lot more to say than just that MAP solution. Um, when we take the MAP solution, we're throwing away the information about the posterior distribution, um, which is a, a complete distribution. Um, so full Bayesian inference would argue that you should use the average of the output over the posterior distribution rather than just use the map. Uh, so this would be what you would uh, map use as your output if you were using full Bayesian inference. It's the average of the outputs <laughs> averaged through the posterior distribution. Um, but actually, this turns out in this case to be identical uh, because you can move the, um, the averaging inside the inner product uh, 
So this is now an average. So this is using the fact that it's a linear function class. Uh, we've moved the average to the inner product, but also then we've made use of the fact that the um, mean of a distribution is equal to its mode. Remember, the map is the mode of the distribution, uh, which is a property of Gaussian distributions, not, of course, of all distributions. So we've used two facts here, the fact that the, it's a Gaussian distribution and the fact that we're using a linear function class tells us that actually full Bayesian influence in this case is the same as uh, the map uh, solution. But we've also got more information, and that is the, uh, because it's a distribution, we also have some measure of uncertainty on the predicted outputs, uh, and this can be uh, computed as, uh, by computing, uh, converting this posterior distribution into uh, the form of a Gaussian. It is a Gaussian distribution, and uh, the mean is the map, and the covariance, uh, sorry, the um, precision uh, matrix is of this form. And so uh, we uh, actually are able to now measure uncertainty in the outputs. Um, and this would be the corresponding, if you like, distribution of outputs that we would expect. Here's the mean, and here's the uncertainty generated through um, uh, Gaussian, white Gaussian variables colored by this square root of this uh, uh, covariance matrix sigma. Um, and uh, so the, <coughs> the variance of the output sigma y can also be expressed in terms of just kernel or, or covariance evaluations in this form here. So basically what this tells us, kappa xx, is the variance that we would experience had we seen no data. That was the prior variance. And this then gets reduced as we factor in the effect of the observations that we have of samples, and their effects, of course, will depend on how closely the outputs of those inputs are correlated with the particular test point. So if the test point's away from any of the training data, then probably this will be a very small reduction, um, but if it's uh, close, then this will significantly reduce the uncertainty in our prediction of that output. So these are all nice properties that we can e evaluate. And finally, the thing to mention, which also Ulrich mentioned uh, earlier, was the evidence, which is somehow a measure of the uh, marginal likelihood of the data averaged over all of the uh, functions. So it's the, it's the normalizing constant. Uh, and we can actually also estimate that uh, here in terms of the uh, variance function and uh, uh, other, uh, obviously, the noise uh, variance as well. Um, and so this can be used potentially to, you know, choose uh, hyperparameters by choosing them to maximize the evidence uh, that you might experience. So I'm not saying this is always a very good way of doing it, but it, it's certainly a, a very um, interesting and principled way of approaching it. So this could be a way of doing model selection over different choices of, say, the sigma squared or other hyperparameters, such as the width of the Gaussian. OK, so my, my main point of bringing this up is to make that connection um, between the kernel methods and this uh, Gaussian process approach. Uh, and this. So just to make clear, this works so nicely because of this relationship between the Gaussian noise model and the Gaussian process prior. Uh, and they are, as uh, Ulrich referred to, conjugate. And so this combination, we compute the posterior exactly. Um, obviously, if we were using classification, we'd want to use a different noise model. And this would lead to uh, computations which can't be solved explicitly or exactly. Uh, and this leads to the need for approximation techniques, such as the ones that uh, Ulrich introduced, and so that's the area of approximate Bayesian inference. I'm not, not going to go into that uh, here. So what I want to do finally is to mention 
how an example of how these kind of a kernel method approaches or machine learning generally can be applied in uh, reinforcement learning in order to sort of uh, illustrate how the trade-offs in different um, choices, uh, kernels or um, more complex learning methods, uh, factor into the performance that we might observe in, in different applications. So um, I'm sure you'll be learning in a lot more detail about reinforcement learning during these two weeks, but uh, it's really uh, studying, I'm not gonna introduce it in detail, but it's studying where your system is taking actions um, which change the state of the system. So the uh, system is having to uh, model, uh, this is, sorry, this is modeled by a Markov decision process. Uh, so the actions typically from a finite set cause a transition to a new state uh, according to a fixed but uh, possibly unknown or typically unknown uh, distribution that, uh, that may need to be learned. Um, and uh, so this probability distribution is something that we will be interested in learning in, in the cases I'm considering. Of course, if you're studying an application in a game like chess or, or Go, then that uh, transition to a new state is known because you know the rules of the game. Um, but in more real world applications, that's not going to be the case. There may be noise in the system. You may not know uh, precise dynamics of the system. Uh, and so you need to learn that transition dynamics as part of the process of uh, learning to solve the reinforcement learning problem. And the key thing you're trying to optimize in the reinforcement learning problem is the reward. And that will be a function of the state and action that you take. And so when you're in a particular state, take a particular action, you receive a reward. And your goal is to find a mapping or policy, which is a mapping from states to actions that gives you the optimal expected discounted <laughs> Okay, so that's a very, very brief introduction to reinforcement learning. Um, so machine learning enters into re reinforcement learning in a number of ways um, by enabling learning aspects of the MDP. Uh, so for example, um, something called the Q function is uh, going to uh, estimate the reward of uh, the policy which says I'm in, if I'm in state S, I take action A, and then I follow a, a, a predefined policy pi. So I've sort of got my policy I've been working with, but I want to know if I took this action and then followed the policy that I'm, I'm, I'm generally following, what would be my uh, expected reward? That's known as the Q function. And again, can be estimated uh, with using machine learning techniques. Uh, so deep Q learning would do that with using a deep neural network um, and so on. So we can treat Q pi uh, as a regression problem uh, with input state and action. Um, it, uh, the only problem here is that as we change our policy, um, this function will change. So we're gonna have to continually relearn that uh, function. And so what we typically will have is a phase of gathering data, which we take action according to some policy. We take that data, use it to train the uh, Q function, and then uh, start to take a new policy, which is improving, hopefully, our reward based on that learned function, uh, and then gather new data from that new policy, which we then use to train a new uh, so these are the sort of iterations that we perform to uh, improve the policy over time. Um, so the 
kernel methods obviously are just a method, can be used uh, for uh, learning different aspects of the MDP. Um, but one of the areas where they actually make a very nice fit is in learning this transition dynamics. Um, and the reason there there's a very nice fit is that actually we don't really need to know the transition dynamics in themselves. What we're interested in is how the reward transitions through those dynamics. In other words, the expected reward. So if we know uh, the rewards for states we might reach from that transition, we're actually looking for the average of that reward function over the probabilities of making the transition to those different states. So if you remember when I was introducing that mean embedding uh, property, I was uh, illustrating how you could um, estimate the expectation of a function evaluation if we had that mean embedding of the distribution. So by having the mean embedding of the distribution, you could then, just by a simple inner product, estimate the mean expected value of that function. So imagine we have a function now for the reward. If we can get a mean embedding of the distribution of the, sorry, of the distribution of the transition dynamics, then we can estimate that expected reward through that transition dynamics. So we don't need to know the precise uh, what I'm trying to say is we don't need to know the probabilities of the individual transition. We just need to know the embedding of that distribution. Um, and so if we, we're thinking of this now, that distribution is represented as a point in the kernel-defined feature space. And so what we need to learn is actually a mapping from a state and an action to the feature space. Um, and that will give us our in this case, conditional mean embedding. It's conditional on the state and action that we take. Um, and if we're able to do that, uh, then we will be able to estimate the, uh, the effects of the um, transitions on our reward, so the expected reward through that transition. Um, and now, suddenly, what we're actually asking the system to do is learn a mapping from an input to a real uh, a vector space, F. It may be infinite dimensional, but it could be just finite dimensional. And so it becomes just a regression problem. So we actually need to learn a regression from uh, the input space defined by the state and the action to this feature space, which is uh, defined through the kernel. And uh, so we can view that as a regression problem and this provides a way of converting, so we can, we can set up that training algorithm. Uh, we have training examples. And effectively, we convert this continuous state MDP into a finite state MDP optimization over the support vectors that come out of that uh, learning that transition regression problem. Um, so this actually enables us to find the optimal um, uh, policy in that finite state MDP, um, which then gives us the uh, kernel parameters for estimating the performance uh, in the general MDP. Um, so applying this to one of the sort of very simplest um, benchmark problems, this is the problem of uh, balancing a pole by on this cart, um, and your actions are to just provide a force uh, to the cart, either pulling it this way or pushing it the other way. Um, and uh, the state of the cart is given by the angle theta and the uh, rate of change of that angle. Um, and your policy has to learn how to, you know, move the cart in order to keep the pole balanced. Um, and again, we're using this iterative algorithm of first, uh, you know, using perhaps a random policy to get some data, then using that to uh, learn um, 
the value function and then op, uh, Q function and then using that uh, policy to drive uh, collection of a second round of data, then using that data to learn a better estimate of the uh, value function and so on. And so this x-axis here measures the number of times we've had to actually re, you know, um, recollect data. And this is the performance that we're seeing as we increase the, um, as we go through the iterations. Um, the compressed M, M, uh, uh, version, uh, which is the one that's performing best, is actually been optimized to try to reduce the computational cost, but it turns out it actually improves the performance as well uh, in a kind of a very nice way. But we're getting up to basically optimal performance after just 10 iterations uh, with this compressed uh, conditional mean embedding approach, uh, which is kind of surprising given that we're actually not building into the system any knowledge of physics or the dynamics of the system. So it's actually learning the whole you know, dynamics and, and, and properties of the system by just observing the performance of this uh, as the policy improves. So that's a, one example. Uh, the second was a slightly more complicated one, which was uh, a quadrocopter simulator, which was, uh, you, you had a task, which was to either uh, navigate the platform, they must navigate to a certain point, or a holding pattern in which there were uh, several quadrocopters that had to kind of hold uh, a position in a circle and maintain a minimum velocity. The, um, the state space was uh, now 13 dimensional um, and the, uh, the action space was three dimensional. So was, there's quite a lot of uh, freedom here. Though, it, you know, this was not actually flying the helicopter. It was just deciding which uh, the direction of travel of the helicopter. Um, so again, the performance of the uh, compressed mean embedding was able very quickly to learn about the dynamics of the system and gain within, well, in this case, maybe 12 iterations, we were up to something like an optimal performance. Um, so I think I just wanted to illustrate this as an example where there's a very nice fit between uh, this case of trying to learn very with very few interactions with the system in order to extract the, as much information as possible. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the, the demands of this particular application make this quite a nice fit. Um, we also use deep learning in this case, but the learning requires more data and therefore much more interaction. So it's much slower in this case to get to that same level of performance. Um, but again, you know, these are just decision choices in particular applications. But uh, I think the, the nice property in a sense of the kernel methods are two things. One is the kind of um, economy of data that required in, 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 in the application, but also this nice fit in terms of measuring the expected, perform, expected evaluation of a function uh, through this mean embedding approach. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, I've given you probably a rather two uh, whistle-stop tour of kernel methods. I hope you've been able to um, take away useful uh, insights and, and intuitions. That's, that's what I would hope uh, to, to be able to give you. Um, I wanted to cover the key properties and illustrate them with particular algorithms. Um, and particularly linked to statistical learning theory and the Bayesian machine learning it was, I think, important to show how they are implementing certain principles that hopefully are underpinning some of the uh, performance that we're seeing in different applications. And the other thing about, I think, kernel methods that's very nice is sort of a plug and play. You've got the algorithm, the kernel, um, and maybe some other uh, aspects that you can, uh, you know, plug in different components and everything, you know, the analysis holds across 
the different, uh, you know, so for example, if you had discrete data, you could have a kernel that maps discrete data into a feature space. Um, if you have um, real value data, you use a kernel that can obviously work with that, you know, like a Gaussian kernel. But the principle of the methods and the analysis of the methods remains the same. Um, and uh, I'll finish there, so uh, open to questions before I, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, John. Two questions. One, oh, oh, yeah, one inflection points within Gaussian processes, just simply intuitively, what do they tell us? Um, maybe that's a simple question, but when you have an inflection point with a regression process, what does that mean? I've read some papers using inflection points to solve computationally, tom computational intractable problems, and I just don't understand. So like the second derivative, like where the sign ah, changes. Okay. okay. Um, so you're thinking uh, in terms of defining the process. I mean, you're thinking of Laplace approximation where you're looking at the optimal solution and then how the uh, covariance matrix looks around that solution. That yeah. So I guess, yeah, when you're doing variational approaches okay. and you do that as a, com as a means to solve computational intractable problems, yeah. you know, why do people do that? Yeah, I, th I mean, okay, so maybe a few things to say there. Um, I mean, first thing to mention is, uh, I think as uh, Ulrich also mentioned, the Laplace approximation isn't the same as the um, approximate Bayesian inference where you do, uh, you know, fit the KL um, optimized with the KL divergence. Um, but the Laplace is useful, and I think we've also been using it in terms of trying to get um, this combination of uh, statistical learning theory and Bayesian inference uh, in that we can use uh, something called the pack Bayes, I think I mentioned it yesterday, but the pack Bayes bounds, uh, which actually measure, uh, um, the measure of complexity there is actually the KL divergence between the prior distribution and the posterior distribution. Um, so in that case, your optimization is to attempt to find a distribution that is not too far from your prior but is still giving you a good performance in terms of the training data. So one way of doing that would be, you know, the, the, the um, uh, Bayesian posterior, but in the pack bayes analysis, there's no requirement to actually uh, use that distribution. And a bit like approximate Bayesian inference, you can make up your own distribution. And if you choose that Laplace approximation, that's actually turns out to be quite a good choice in terms of getting that KL divergence small while keeping. And what it will motivate is this idea of finding broad uh, pools of attraction or you know broad minima because there the uh, posterior distribution can have a broad uh, variance and so there's likely to be a much lower um, in um, KL divergence with the prior. Uh, so the KL divergence will be much, it will be less costly as a choice of distribution. Uh, that are, so you're looking for areas where you can allow a lot of variance on the weights 
without affecting the classification. So somehow you've reached a region in the space that is a broad local minimum. Um, so that, I mean, that is motivated, I think, also by um, other intuitions about the performance, say, of deep learning. And in that case, we've been able to get actually good bounds for deep networks by using that approach, provided we use that to drive the algorithm. So stochastic gradient descent doesn't always arrive at those kind of broad minima. Um, but if you add that in as an const extra constraint, you end up with broad minima that actually have non-trivial bounds in performance using this pack-based method. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, that's the uh, kind of association that it brought in my mind. I've got one more quick question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that the kernels within uh, you know, are typically semi-definite, like positive semi-definite. Uh, so I guess I think that means it's uh, not full rank and you're going to have zero, some zero eigenvalues potentially. And what are you going to do with invertibility issues if you want to mix two GPs together, for example? Uh, do you just discard the uh, columns that, have, uh, that are on uh, independent? Yeah, how do I prevent NANs in my invertible uh, for formulas, I guess is the question. Yeah, I mean, in ridge regression, of course, that won't happen because you add the ridge. So you've got the regularization parameters adding a, a lambda times the identity matrix. So the, you know, the kernel matrix itself will have non-zero. So when you add the lambda, you're going to have at least plus lambda, uh, which stabilizes things. Um, I think the, in, in the case of support vector machines, this also doesn't enter because of the fact that um, you're again using a regularization in terms of the weight vectors. So um, there is you know, good stability. Where things tend to break down there is if the no data is very noisy, then you get a very large number of support vectors. Um, I've never heard of people using anything like, you know, pseudo inverses or anything like that. I guess they could be explored, I don't know. Um, but generally, it would be ramping up the regularization that would ensure uh, stability of the algorithm. Any more questions? If there are no more questions, this was also John's last talk, so uh, let us just thank him for that, and then we'll wait for lunch. Thank you.